That's a fantastic <laughs> What are you so, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Wernham. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Wernham. That's <laughs> close. That's <laughs> right. So, from MIT, a little more. Yes. Thanks. Uh, happy birthday, Bob. Joyeux anniversaire, Professor Boyd. Je suis désolé, mais je ne parle pas qu'un peu de français. I, uh, my relationship with Bob started in 2005 uh, with an email. I was frantically working on my master's thesis, waiting to hear back from PhD programs that I had applied to, and as I was typing, an email popped up from Robert W. Boyd, and I looked over on my desk at a book with a red cover that said Robert W. Boyd. My wife tells me I squealed a little. <laughs> Um, it was the wonderful news that I had been accepted to the PhD program at Rochester. I was very excited. Um, when we toured the campus after we got done, my wife said, so what do you think? I said, well, it's a family decision and we need to talk about it, but if I were single, I'd cancel my return ticket right now. <laughs> um, I, did, I, uh, I start, joined Bob's group then in 2006. I did overlap with Hiduk. I remember we had a conversation uh, as he was getting ready to go home to Korea for his, his wedding. Uh, all smiles and he, we talked, he talked about what, what would be involved and he, he asked, so how many days is an American wedding? And I said, no, 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 no. There's, there, there's a reception, it's usually about an hour or so, and then there's a, or sorry, there's a, a ceremony for a few hours or so, and the, or for an hour, reception for a few hours or so after that. And, you know, sometimes the family will get together tomorrow morning for breakfast, and uh, then there's the rehearsal dinner the night before, and the bachelor and bachelorette. You know, it's about four days. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so as it happens, I'm still using the same laptop I had in grad school, which means I have a few old files sitting around. <laughs> so, so, so the uh, the story behind this poster is that the James Bond movie Goldeneye had come out some some years before, and as we were talking, particularly Andreas was wondering what to do for this poster for for Xenia for her gradu graduation. We found that one of the villains in the movie Goldeneye was named Ksenia. Uh, well, that was that was the end of that. And so uh, that is a picture of the a promotional poster for the actress who played the villain Ksenia with Professor Dolgaleva's face. That is Pierce Brosnan's body with Professor Boyd's head. I know you can't tell the difference. <laughs> um, and yes, those are ND Yag particles floating in suspension in the flames behind him. So. I, um, uh, we, we, this started a theme of movie uh, posters for, for graduation. We had always done sort of gag posters when somebody was going to defend their dissertation. Um, but starting from, from this point on, this was just such an excellent bit of work by Andreas that we had to stay on the movie theme. And so, Ebrahim, I was delighted to see that you've now given Bob his own movie trailer. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I, I did mention that I had, I had had Bob's book on my desk when I got that email. I had already taken a graduate level course in nonlinear optics based on Bob's book when I arrived at Rochester and decided wisely that I would take it again anyway from Bob himself and I made the right choice. I learned a ton. Actually, I was the teaching assistant for the course the year after that and learned a ton again. Um, it's just impossible not to learn from being around Bob. One of the things I did learn, though, is one of his favorite problems, how to derive the refractive index of glass, starting from Schrodinger's equation, and just making some reasonable assumptions about physical quantities. Um, that was the year I was the TA for the course that he assigned that, and the students came to me having no idea how to do it, and I worked through it. It's a very long, intricate problem. I learned a lot from it, but um, I, I got to the end of the problem, and I got a refractive index of 1.04, which is closer to air than glass. And I, I went back over it, and I couldn't figure out what I had done. And I said, Professor Boyd, do you have the solution? Could I take a look at it? I was gratified to see that I had, I had done everything exactly the way he had done, including I remembered that he said, you know, condensed matter is always about 10 to the 21st per cubic centimeter, or 10 to the 27th per cubic meter. Um, so everything seemed right. And 
somewhere in about step six, uh, you had to make an assumption about the value of the dipole moment. And I had just said, well, okay, so some fundamental constants, charge of the electron times the Bohr radius of the hydrogen atom. Uh, that's a reasonable assumption, but it turns out that what's also a reasonable assumption is 2.5 times E times A naught, and that gives you a refractive index of about 1.5. So if anybody else has to do that problem in here, there's the secret. You just need to make that reasonable assumption. Um, I just gave that lecture on Monday of the week. <laughs> I'm sorry if I exactly. spoiled it. <laughs> oh, great, great, great. Yeah. Um, uh, I was the teaching assistant at the time, and we spent an entire recitation going over that, how to do that problem. It was, it was really fun, actually. Um, it does. It makes you believe in physics. Yep. It is incredible. Um, so, so Bob also, uh, that, that red edition of his book was, was in CGS units, which he referred to as the units God uses when he does physics. <laughs> uh, he, he very reluctantly uh, rewrote the book and issued an edition in SI units, uh, also the year that I was TAing the course. And at one point, I could tell you where every factor of 4 pi epsilon not belonged in those equations, because we had to go every, over every single one of them. Um, it was, uh, it was an enjoyable time. Certainly I learned an enormous amount of technical material from Bob, but one of the, one of the great advantages of, of working alongside Bob and of having him as a mentor is just watching how he did research. And that was especially meaningful for me. I think more than anything else, the thing that, that characterizes Bob's approach to research is just as Jonathan said and as others have said, everyone is a potential collaborator and everyone is a potential friend. Bob used the word friend in ways I hadn't thought of before, in ways that opened me to new possibilities. Um, also gave me an opportunity to learn just how much I love writing. It took until grad school to find out, but it turns out I do like to write. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite quotes from Bob was, uh, he has, uh, he has a beautiful home here in Ottawa, and he has a beautiful home near Rochester. Uh, his home near Rochester is on Lake Ontario. That picture there is taken from a group party on a very cold and windy July day. Uh, the, the waves don't normally look like that, but I particularly liked that picture. Um, Bob was describing his house to someone at, at a party there, and, and he pointed out towards the lake and said, how can anything bother me when I wake up to see this? I just thought it was such a great attitude. Um, I did want to mention, Ksenia had asked it, that I would just say a little bit about what I've done in research since I graduated from Bob's lab. I work at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. We completed a project a couple years ago on optical beam steering using liquid crystal devices. We did this in collaboration with Kent State University where there's a liquid crystal institute. So a liquid crystal polarization grating or a pancheratinum phase device, it's called by both names. On, on the left, the, the basic idea of the operation is that you can turn a hologram, a liquid crystal hologram, into a beam steering device if you have the right pattern in the liquid crystals. So you can see the sort of spiraling orientation of the rod-shaped liquid crystal molecules. What this has the effect of doing is steering left circular polarization in one direction and right circular in the other direction. And you can see those two directions are labeled M equals plus one and M equals minus one. There's, there's a certain diffractive effect to this steering and those are essentially the plus one and minus one diffractive orders. On the right, the way these devices are made is you start with a thin glass substrate and spin coat it with a photo alignment layer, uh, a molecule thick layer of, in this case, an, an azo dye called brilliant yellow. And after putting the, the brilliant yellow on and baking it, you put it in a, a, a writing setup. You can see in the blue diagram in the bottom center. What we have there is essentially a hologram writing setup, but with beams of opposite circular polarizations writing the pattern. And the, the interference of those two beams creates this E-field vectors that cause the spiraling orientation of the rod-like molecules in the brilliant yellow dye. Once you've photo-aligned the liquid crystals, you fix the layer in place, and then you spin coat repeated thin layers of the liquid crystal molecules themselves. They're called reactive messagens. 
and by putting the right number of layers to form a half wave thickness, you can get nearly perfect efficiency in your beam steering. Um, so a, a close-up view of the wafer being written is shown in the bottom right, and just above that is uh, someone in our lab holding up the wafer that they had just made. The brilliant yellow dye does have a, a slight yellow cast to it, and you can see the yellow spot in the center. That's where the, the overhead lights from the room are actually being steered by the, the pattern on the, on the device. Um, I do have a couple of photographs of these devices working. You know, when you say liquid crystals and beam steering, you think of what you might do with a spatial light modulator. I'm sure many of us have done that in Bob's lab. I know I did. Um, and that, that's good to a few degrees. These devices are discrete steering because of the diffractive orders, but can steer at plus and minus 25, plus and minus 40, potentially plus and minus 60 degrees. I'm particularly proud of that pair of photographs on the left. Those are photographs. Uh, they are not edited except to animate them one after the other. Uh, it's a multiple exposure. The first exposure was with the room lights off and the second exposure, uh, sorry, the first was with the lights on. Second was with the lights off and someone holding a fluorescent IR card in front of the beam and moving it all along the beam path to expose it. It's actually an infrared beam that you're seeing the fluorescence from there. You didn't know. How, how do you control it? Uh, so, it's a, it's a discrete steering and you control it by switching between the two polarizations. And, uh, and so you could imagine having one of these devices at a wide angle, one at half of that angle, one at half of that angle with polarization switchers in between. And by switching the different polarization switchers, you can select among any of a number of spots in the far field. Um, and uh, this, was an, this was an interesting problem to pursue. I, uh, I don't know that it overlapped particularly well with any of the research that I did in Bob's lab, but I thought I'd report a little bit about what I've been doing since I left. Um, you know, every PhD program is hard, and it's meant to be hard. It's a good growing experience and a good learning opportunity. At times when things were hard in my program, I was always comforted by the fact that I had a choice opportunity that very few people had to be working in Bob's lab. Thank you. That is an interesting question. I haven't. The one thing I did look at was how does it hold up under increased power? Um, what happens then is probably due to some heating, the efficiency goes down, the steering angle stays the same because it's a diffractive effect. Um, but that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, we should. Thank you. <laughs> oh, excellent. Okay. Let's do it.